Good evening. It is 7.14 p.m. on Sunday, September 29th, 2019, and I did not just get up, but this is five more minutes. This is a re-record of Sunday's original recording because Facebook Live is just failing me. It is producing videos that are unusable with occasional glitching, and uh, I think I'm going to have to ditch it. But because I wanted my rewatch of Cowboy Bebop to be something people could actually visit, uh, I decided to re-record it. So this is take two of my rewatch of session three of Cowboy Bebop, Honky Tonk Women. So I'll be deleting the old one. This is the new one. Welcome. So this is a fun episode. Of course, we're introducing Faye Valentine, the fourth member of the Bebop crew after Spike and Jet. And then we met Ayn, who joined the crew last time. I had forgotten, actually, until this rewatch that Faye doesn't actually join the crew in this episode. At the end of this episode, they go their separate ways. But of course, their paths cross again later. And in case that wasn't clear, she is in the opening credits. Anyway, uh, I would be, uh, it's something I need to say up front that I'm a big fan of Faye Valentine, but one of the things that I, makes me a fan of her is, well, okay, how to put this? I found Faye Valentine to be a very influential character for me, and I drew a lot of things that I loved about her, uh, drew upon those things for inspiration when writing Casey, the heroine of my audio drama Space Casey, who is a con artist lady in space. And it's interesting rewatching the material here because, you know, Faye's not the only influence on Casey, but she's a big one. And so it's interesting looking at Faye as distinct from Casey and finding that there are places where I think she seems to be acting more or less out of character. And I wonder, is that just because I'm kind of wanting her to act like Casey? So case in point, the introduction scene for Faye is awesome in terms of <coughs> its surprise, its cool imagery. You know, we have this little shop back on Mars and uh, she, you know, saunters in. She's the hot girl in the ridiculous outfit. And then she comes in and she gets a cigar from the shopkeep, which, you know, is, is it's all played as, oh, she's not just a hot girl. She's the cool hot girl. But then we see her uh, you know, some people coming in from outside and we see her sort of fiddling with some stuff. And then pretty soon she turns around and she's got the sunglasses, the cigar and the machine gun <laughs> shooting at the guys who are coming for her out the window with her motto, shoot them before they shoot you. And it's all very cool. But my instinct when watching it is that it seems out of character for Faye. Um, only, I mean, obviously if we hadn't seen anything, we would have no way of making that assessment. It's our first introduction to the character after all. But I feel like while Faye over the course of the series is absolutely someone who is not afraid to make big messes in the name of self-preservation, I don't really think of her as someone who goes to violence first, right? We don't really see her do that later. Like, um, you know, we do see her defend her, like in her ship, for example, she blasts her way out of the casino. She defends herself with countermeasures that turn missiles back at the end. We'll come back to that later. But I don't usually, in, you know, thinking back over the course of the series, I don't think of her as someone who goes to violence as, like, a first option. Add to that the fact that in this particular circumstance, as we learn, 
they want her to do something for them. They're not trying to kill her. Therefore, this whole shoot them before they shoot you mantra, the idea that she opens fire on them is the only reason that they return fire. So she might have gotten herself killed when they weren't even trying to actually kill her. So is her approach here, this motto, shoot them before you, they shoot you, is that really like a useful motto that saves your life? Or is it actually just cool talk when you're really just a mess doing whatever you can think of in any given moment? Um, I think it's interesting to see. Uh, there's a moment where we kind of don't get to see what actually happens because we see her uh, having just mowed down a couple of guys outside, but then they pull up a car with a big machine gun, and we see that that machine gun open fire. Poor shopkeeper is getting his his shop blasted to pieces. Poor guy. And it's not clear how she would have avoided all that gunfire, but the next time we see her, she's surrounded with about a dozen guns in her face. It's like, hey, I surrender. Um, and... So we discover that what they want from her and we learn a lot of things about her first of all in that opening sequence where she just looks super cool but I think it'll be I want to re-examine as we go of course over the course of the series how much she ultimately either lives up to or departs from what we would think of her based on that opening scene. I'm curious because my my gut right now is that it's this opening scene, although very cool, is not really that representative of how Faye actually generally solves problems, which is usually not violence first. And But then again, I have to consider the idea that Casey, who is not a violent character, am I just reacting to the fact that I drew the nonviolent pieces of Faye to make Casey, and now I'm trying to reverse project Casey onto Faye. Well, we'll see as the series progresses. But in the meantime, she's been captured by this big shot, mobbed up casino guy who uh, speculates that she is so lucky that perhaps she's actually the reincarnation of Poker Alice, who was a real person back in the Old West. And then, of course, you know, Faye comments on, you know, well, how could that be true? She, was, she would be over 200 years old. And he's like, well, also, she was supposedly never cheated. And this is where he does a very creepy, but cool from a storytelling way, you know, in terms of showing us who this guy is. Very creepy, like he trails his fingers up the back of her thigh, which is kind of gross. But then he also reveals that he has pulled an ace out of her pants because she is a cheater. She is very much a cheater. That is, that is who she is. She'll do whatever it takes to get by. And so what he wants her to do is use her skills at cheating to help him carry out his very dumb plan. Now, let's talk a little bit about his plan, okay? The plan, as we're led to understand, is that there is a super-duper AI-powered hack machine software program that could decrypt anything. Certainly, we can understand why that would be valuable. Oh, but it needs a special password to use it, a special key. Okay, well, needs the key, right, in order to use this. Some other guy has the key and is planning to bring it to him. But we've got to keep this secret for some reason. So the plan is that this guy will come to the casino, which our bad guy owns, and instead of just bringing it to him, he's going to bring it with a bunch of other chips to a blackjack table where he will proceed to lose all his money. But can he lose his money just by playing badly? No, I guess maybe someone is watching or something, even though we see no evidence of any authorities in the area. So he has to play well, but lose anyway, because Faye is the dealer and she's cheating. And then once he has lost all his money, 
he will tip her the very last chip, which will be the special chip that contains the key for the special software in it. And then she'll bring it to Casino Guy and her debts will be canceled. We learn she's got a lot of debt. That's going to be a recurring theme for Faye. So, you know, somewhat of a recurring theme for the whole show. The crew of the Bebop has trouble with money. So she is on board because of the promise that her debts would be canceled. But again, what's with the overcomplicated plan here? There's so many ways that it could go bad and does as we see the episode progress. It's a super dumb plan. This guy, as we see later, he can do whatever he wants. He doesn't seem worried about the police or anyone like that. Why does he not just have the guy bring them the freaking chip? Why does it even need to be disguised as a chip? It's so I want to comment, though, because I'm talking about how dumb this plan is, but I'm not criticizing the episode in that regard because what it does is it takes this episode out of being like a thriller and into being a farce this is not a suspense thriller this is not james bond this is a dumb plan from a dumb guy that fails in dumb ways and then we have Faye and spike who just get drunk caught up in it you know, it's not their plan. They're not responsible for it. They're just caught up in the momentum with this whole dumb plan going on. And they're constantly befuddled because they can't figure out why anything would work this way. And yet now someone's trying to kill them about it. And so I think it's kind of, uh, it lends a fun energy to it, even though it's super dumb and it fails in very obvious ways. So we have her planning to carry out this whole subterfuge as the blackjack dealer. In the meantime, we have Spike and Jet who have come to the casino because they're down to their last little bit of money again. And I guess Jet had a dream where Charlie Parker, the famous jazz musician, gave him some ancient philosophical sayings about only hands can wash, wash hands, and that is why he's supposed to go win money at a casino. Spike is also skeptical, but hey, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, Jet does look good in his spiffy suit, um, but it's interesting that he specifically mentions to Spike, don't win too much or else you'll get us kicked out. And, you know, based on what we've seen from Spike so far, that in seems entirely reasonable. What with his quick sticky fingers and all, and his, uh, you know, quick thinking and uh, ability to suss out detail, it makes sense that he might be good at, you know, gambling and or cheating at gambling. What we see him do is first earn, an, you know, a little starter money by... Uh, helping these three old guys that we've seen before who are going to be recurring cameos throughout the series. Uh, they're play, trying to play some game or other, and he helps them win a bunch of money, so he takes a little bit as a tip, and that's how he gets his sort of seed money for playing around the casino for a little while. But this is where he goes to the blackjack table where Faye is the dealer, and here is, you know, failure point number one of the dumb plan, is that she is given uh, an image of the guy she's supposed to work with, but it's on this old kind of crappy display that is sort of distorted and messed up, so she can't really see <laughs> very clearly. And it looks just enough like Spike that she assumes Spike is the actual guy. This sort of mistaken identity is a farce trope, not a thriller trope. This whole thing's a farce, and it's fun that way, but and I think that's why it is perfectly acceptable to enjoy the episode by poking fun at how dumb this super this stupid plan is. So she proceeds to try to cheat in order to make him lose all his money. 
Now, this is left kind of subtle, but I believe the implication is that he sees her cheating and is trying to win anyway. But we see, and we see him accumulate a big stack of chips, certainly more than he started with. But eventually, he goes ahead and he makes one last bet for all but the last chip. And, uh, you know, so she, you know, cheats to take it from him. And here's another bit that kind of doesn't really make any sense because he's, Spike is playing into what she expects of the plan, although he doesn't actually know anything about the plan. So does it really make sense that he would make a big deal about the last chip if he doesn't know this plan? Eh, eh, it's fine. So he basically gives up, like, well, you cleaned me out except for this last chip. Guess I'll keep it as a souvenir. And, you know, this is where she's saying, oh, wait, hey, wait a minute. That's not the plan. You're supposed to give it to me because it's the special chip I'm supposed to take up to Casino Boss, blah, 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 blah. So the, with the plan exploding around her, she chases after him, right? And she confronts him. And this is where he's having this reaction of like, what's your problem, lady? I saw that you were cheating the whole time and I didn't say anything. And now you're going to come after me because I didn't give you my last chip. And I think that there's this great moment there where we get a little bit of game recognized game between them, right? Because what we get is he has been, you know, observing that she's cheating all along. And because he's not in this to win a bunch of money, in fact, he was specifically told by Jet not to win a bunch of money because he'd get everyone kicked out of the casino. So he's just looking for a good time. And I think when he sees her cheating, there's a, a degree of uh, respect and um, uh, collegial... Uh, um, civility. I don't know. I'm, I'm think there's, um, I'm not thinking of the word that I wanted, but the point is he's seeing her doing her thing. He doesn't really care. Like he doesn't want to report her. He doesn't want to interfere with what she's doing. He's like, all right, do your thing. That's fine. He doesn't care. He's just planning to leave. But then when she confronts him about it, he's like, what's this? I thought that I was already doing you a solid by not pointing out that you're cheating. But then what he realizes is, oh, she's actually doing something else. There's some other plan involved. I don't really care because it's inconveniencing me, but we'll, we'll see. And this, of course, is her bit where she realizes, wait, you knew I was cheating all along? Hmm. And then they're both sort of seeing like, oh. What's going on there? But this is where we see Casino Guy's goons coming up because presumably, you know, they've been watching on all the cameras. They know that the plan is already exploding because of course it is. It's a stupid plan. And so they confront, oh no, okay, I take it back. I skipped a step because this is another farce coincidence. We get another farce trope, not real suspense thriller do uh, trope, which is that by sheer coincidence, Spike, after leaving the table, bumps into the actual mark and they exchange their one chip. Now, like, why does he only have, the, the like, the actual guy, why does he only have the one chip? Like, wasn't he supposed to have more and then lose it all except the last chip? But, like, and it's just coincidence that they each have their own chip but they, they they swap them and so spike has the real one like it's weird coincidence stuff but that's the sort of thing that happens in a farce and we roll with it right and so now we're in a position where spike doesn't know anything about the plan but he's not only been mistaken for this actual guy but now he does actually have the actual chip and just doesn't know it but when the goons are coming in they're seeing what's going on. She left the table. She didn't seem to get the chip. She's chasing after this guy. What's going on? So they send in the goons. She runs away. And Spike is suddenly like, you know, face to face with these guys who are saying, we're going to ask you a few questions. Like what? Kapow. They sucker punch him. And this is 
you know, where we, we know Spike already, we know one of the things about Spike is he's very good hand to hand and kind of likes it. So there's a cool bit where they sucker punch him and it's pretty hard punch and we see him like lean way over, but he's got the balance to not go down and he just kind of stands up and he's like, oh, okay, we're doing this now. Great. And so he beats up those guys, more guys come. He's like, all right, great fitness program here. Um, and so he's having fun fighting a bunch of people. And this, then of course, for comic relief, Q Jet, who actually has won some money at the slot machines, but is realizing now, oh no, Spike has gotten in a fight. We're getting kicked out after all. In the meantime, Faye, because she always has backup plans, uh, ha runs off and uses her bracelet to remote control her zip craft to literally blast its way out of the hangar with missiles, shoot its way into this casino. And then, uh, you know, she gets on board and she's using heavy weaponry to blast a big hole in the wall so that she can escape on this little zip craft. And it's just, again, it's so like, it's survival as priority number one with really no consideration whatsoever to how big a mess she's leaving behind her, even though ultimately in the grand scheme of things, you know, you, you keep running, making a, leaving a mess behind you, it trails after you. you. You start accumulating a long list of places you can never go back to and people who maybe want to hunt you down or put a six, wulong, six million Wulong bounty on you as happens in this particular case. But in any event, she is surprised to realize that the also savvy uh, and scrappy uh, scoundrels interested in self-preservation, Jet and Spike managed to hitchhike aboard her little zip craft. And so all three of them escape on her zip craft. And here's where we get a soft spot from Faye. Now, this is something where, you know, you, you maybe could write it off as just, you know, she's, she's doing what she's doing because that's what the plot needs to have happen. But if we think about it in this circumstance, given everything that just happened, Faye is the one in control. She's piloting her ship. They're clinging to the outside desperately. She could shake them off. She could fly into space. She could do anything she wants. But what she does is volunteer to take them back to their ship. And I think the reason she does that is because that is who Faye actually is. Her sort of go-to moves are manipulating people and working with that sort of relationship. And so she's kind of hoping that she can work with them and maybe get them to do what she wants as opposed to just ditching them. And she, of course, is still thinking, well, okay, maybe if I can work with them, maybe I can get the chip. I don't know. We're, we'll see what happens. But in any event, she wants to work through connections with people as opposed to just solo. So she takes them, them back to, uh, she takes them back to their ship whereupon they uh, promptly turn the tables on her and handcuff her in the bathroom. And this is where I think we get our glimpse of like, you know, we, we've seen Faye's, you know, self-defense mechanisms, but here's where I think we get to the parts that I remember most fondly about Faye, which is just, she's willing to do or say anything to just save her own skin. And she is not shy about changing her story in an instant. If the first one doesn't seem like it's working, just roll with it. So, you know, she's, she's talking about like, oh, okay, well, what you actually need to do is like, oh, how, how cruel you are to lock me up. Oh, wait, no, actually what you need to do is turn that chip into that guy. He'll pay you a lot of money for it. And then, oh, wait, uh, no, what, what I am is I, I'm a traveler. I'm, it's in my blood. I travel all the time. You can't lock me up. And she's howling like a wolf. She's just doing everything and anything she can think of to try to manipulate these guys. But again, part of what we know, as we see later, is she's got plans and plans within plans and backup things all the time. So 
it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter. She's a shotgun of a person. You know, she just throws anything she can at the wall. And then the first thing that sticks, she just runs with it. And so she's just doing whatever she can. But in the meantime, Spike and Jet, they're a little savvier than the average person that she tries to run her games on. So, you know, they decide to lock her in the bathroom and Jet checks out the chip she's talking about and turns out, oh yeah, okay, not only does it have a microchip inside, but here's where we get a little bit of a clue of his background. He mentions, uh, you know, a history with the police and knowing the detail, this is where we learn about this decryption program, the Crypt Breaker. And so figures out what this chip is, what it means, like, and why it would be so valuable. And in the meantime, Spike has uh, learned that, you know, Casino Guy has put out this bounty on Faye. And so, you know, they're already talking about how, you know, they lost all the money that Jet had won at the casino. And so they were talking about maybe selling her ship in order to pay for it. But now they're in a position of like, well, okay, we've got this really valuable chip and it's very valuable to a very bad guy. Is it worth trying to do business with him? Hmm. But there's also now a bounty. So they're starting to get dollar signs, wulong signs in their eyes of like, could we, you know, uh, hat trick this thing, sell the chip to the bad guy, turn Faye into the police for the bounty and sell her ship? Right. And so they're they're starting to think about what they're going to do. But here is, of course, when their plan goes awry, because Faye locked in the bathroom has a communicator hidden in her lipstick. And so they leave her alone and, you know, she starts doing her own thing. So what she does is promptly call a casino guy and say, come and help me. It's not my fault. I, I tried to follow the plan. You know, I got hijacked. They've got the chip. And so she's trying to still just save her own skin because now that she's realized that Jet and Spike are not going to work with her. And then so Casino Guy now knows where they are, shows up, demands the chip. They negotiate. You're like, okay, well, I guess we're going to do an exchange for 30 million Wulongs. It's worth way more than that, but that's a convenience fee. But it's always, it's this very tenuous thing because we know this casino guy's a bad dude, right? He doesn't want anyone else to know what's going on. He doesn't want anyone else to know what this thing is or who has it. He's going to just kill them, right? Like he doesn't, he doesn't, intent to live up to this bargain. We know that. And Spike and Jet, even if they don't know that, know that, they're, you know, it's like, eh, that seems possible. But in the meantime, we're going to get this ridiculous zero G exchange. And I think you could probably hand wave some logic, you know, story logic reasons why they would do it that way. I guess just because, you know, okay, well, Spike and Jet on the Bebop don't trust Casino Guy. They don't want to go anywhere with him to be on his turf. They don't want to leave, you know, so if they don't want to leave, no one wants to trust the other to go somewhere with them. So if they want to exchange there, and they but they don't want to, you know, breach the sanctity of their own ship. Okay, yeah, you exchange outside in space. But it just seems like, oh yeah, this incredibly valuable poker chip we're just going to expose to the vastness of space because sure, why not? All right. Uh, but we get a fun sequence where uh, Spike is going out in a spacesuit that looks very much like Dave Bowman's from uh, 2001. It's similar enough. I can't imagine it's a coincidence, especially since this show is just loaded with those sorts of references. I mean, for example, the casino guy, cas casino guy's casino is named spiders on Mars. Um, you know, so that's, that's a David Bowie reference right there and all sorts of good stuff. Um, oh, you know what? I was just scrolling down on this wiki to, you know, other references. And I just forgot that I, uh, I realized I forgot to even mention at early on the, the incredibly gross trick with Spike where he's smoking and it's a non-smoking area. So he puts out the cigarette by swallowing it. 
He's just got it in his mouth and then completely hands free. He just tongues it into his mouth and swallows it. And he's like, ugh, ugh, that's so gross. And yet he does it like a stupid human trick. And I think it's interesting and I wanted to talk about it. And I'm glad I remembered to because we still, as of this episode, don't know very much about Spike's backstory, right? We, we kind of know what he's good at. We know, we saw just a little bit of this shootout in a church carrying flowers. So we know he's got secrets, but we don't really know what his deal is. But just imagine the kind of person who would ever learn or teach himself how to swallow a lit cigarette. That's, that's someone who, um, in Lawrence of Arabia, there's a whole sequence where, uh, what Lawrence likes to do is put out matches with his fingers, not by like licking them and just doing it quick, but just like creeping his fingers up and just gradually choking it out. And, and it's just this sort of like fascination, like fidget thing that he does. And then someone else later tries to do it and he's like, ow, that hurts. And Lawrence is saying, well, of course it hurts. And so what's the trick then? And he says, the trick is not minding that it hurts. Now, it's a very cool line. In fact, Prometheus, you know, cribbed from it uh, by having uh, Michael Fassbender's character deliberately, like, quote it and reference it, like being obsessed with it. Um, but I think that is kind of a telling detail for Spike there, too. Just like the kind of person who, for no reason other than it's a dumb thing he can do, decides to swallow a lit cigarette. But it also kind of sets up what he does later, which is that he can swallow things and then kind of cough them back up on command, right? He swallows the lit cigarette in the elevator, but then later when he's by an ashtray, he just sort of and he spits it out into the ashtray, which of course is what he does with the chip later. So it's kind of, it's, it sets it up, but I, I think it's, it's that sort of nifty little attention to detail that this show is really good at. Anyway, where were we? Yes, the transfer. Um, but in the meantime, while Spike and Jet are preparing, negotiating with this casino guy, this is where Plan C from uh, Faye is, is, you know, kicking in. She has not only got the communicator and a lipstick, but she's also got, uh, it's like an earring or something. Like she's manipulated uh, Jet enough to say, you know, at least uncuff one hand. I can't even go to the bathroom like this. But of course, with one hand free, Pick, 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 pick. She picks the lock on the other handcuff. She's free. Uh, Ein spots her and sort of chases her around. There's a nice little comic moment there where we see her trying to slink through the ship and getting caught and chased by a corgi, which is silly. But she makes it to her ship. And in the middle of this, you know, transfer that's happening, she blasts her way out of the hangar again, like for no reason. Like, she could have just opened the hangar door, presumably. You know, Jet actually calls out. It's like, you're supposed to hang open the hangar door first. But, of course, she blasts her way out because that's her style. And um, so she's escaping. And so that's all happening um, in, you know, in, the, in parallel with Spike and the casino guy. So Spike and the casino, uh, you know, the casino guy's goon comes out with a briefcase full of what looks like money, but we see is only like one layer of money and it's hollow on the other side with a gun in it. And it's basically like, oh yeah, as soon as he tosses the coin, shoot him. But Spike, because he's not, he's no dummy, he tosses the chip, but he does so in a moment where the timing is, he like throws it slow and then we see the other guy immediately go for the gun, but the other guy can't immediately shoot him because there's this rotating piece of the ship that's passing in between. And Spike is hiding behind it. There's a nice, cool little sequence of moves where he flips around. He manages to, you know, dodge the other guy's bullets, disarm him, kick him off the side of the ship, send him flying off into space, and then land and reattach his magnetic boots just in time to catch the chip that he threw at the beginning of that whole little thing that was sort of just floating slowly through space uh, on its trajectory. It, and it's, it's a very cool sequence, right? But that's just in time for Faye and her little Zipcraft to show up 
and use a little gripper claw to steal the briefcase. But the joke's on her because it's not actually that much money in it because it was faked, right? So it's like now she's trying to get away. Casino guy fires a bunch of missiles at her, not realizing that she's got these weird countermeasures that can reverse the polarity or whatever of missiles. And it sends it back and blows up Casino guy's flight deck, presumably killing him. And so now this is totally a farce ending, right? Because Casino guy's dead. Faye has escaped, thinking she has a lot of money, only to probably, presumably later discover she doesn't actually have a lot of money. And she's still in a ton of debt. And meanwhile, Spike and Jet are now left with nothing but this little chip that is only valuable to bad, evil people. And I, so it's like, what are you going to do? And so it's telling, I think, that Spike and Jet, what do they do with a chip like this? It's a very dangerous tool. And it's really only valuable, like, it's only good for doing bad things. And it's not really their style. They're bounty hunters. They're not criminals, right? So they're not good guys, exactly. But they're certainly not criminals either. They're not bad guys. They don't want to give this powerful criminal tool to a bad guy. I mean, they were maybe going to trade it for a bunch of money, but uh, but now it's that's dangerous. You, you know, the sort of person who would want to buy this thing is the same kind of person who's going to betray you over it. So what do you do with it? Well, you want to turn it into the cops? That doesn't seem right either. So, of course, what do they do? <laughs> they take it back to a casino and they make a bet with it. And so that's this episode. Uh, Faye uh, has gone off on her own, not with, with a lot less money than she thinks she has. You know, Spike and Jed are back where they started, just like always. Uh, Ayn is running around being cute still. And uh, Casino Guy got himself blown up, which is, I think, a just payment for his stupid, stupid plan. So that's Honky Tonk Women. It's, it's a great episode, I think, and uh, I'm very excited to, you know, continue. And, you know, as I mentioned, I think I'm going to try to keep watching Faye as we continue with this rewatch to see... Uh, how she uh, how she develops and whether I'm maybe misremembering how violent a person she is, how quick to violence that is. Certainly, afraid of violence, not necessarily. She is willing to use violence if she has to, but it's a question of, is that her go-to move or does she only do it when pinned down? That opening scene would suggest that it's go-to move, plan A, first first response. She carries around a machine gun in a tiny little purse, apparently. Whereas I feel like the Faye we learn in the rest of the series doesn't feel like that's her, her style, but we'll see. So I may be misremembering. We'll see. But uh, yeah, so next week we'll be talking about session four, Gateway Shuffle, which, as I recall, has a number of things that I really like and a couple of things that I maybe don't like quite as much. But I haven't watched it in a while, so we'll see. So... In the meantime, uh, congratulations if you made it this far. This take two is actually even longer than the original one, which sucked because of the all sorts of weird digital artifacting that was put in there against my will. So I hope this one was better, and I'll be back next week for that. But in the meantime, I'll talk to you tomorrow for five more minutes. <laughs>